Good afternoon, or good morning, or good noon to you all. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, as you know, we had a uh, long and eventful day uh, yesterday, uh, but it is uh, great to be back with you. I have no announcements to make, so I will go straight to your questions. Josh. Thanks, Jay. If President Assad sees the White House say we've concluded that they have used chemical weapons and then say, well, we're not 100% sure and we're going to kind of hold off while we figure it out completely, doesn't that uh, give Assad reason to doubt that the U.S. is serious when we say don't cross this line or else? No. Because what uh, the White House has said uh, is that uh, it has been assessed by our intelligence community with varying degrees of confidence that the Syrian regime has used chemical weapons on a small scale in Syria, specifically the chemical agent sarin. And this assessment is based in part on physiological samples. Now, we are working to establish credible and corroborated facts to build on this intelligence assessment in order to establish a definitive judgment as to whether or not the President's red line has been crossed and to inform our decision making about next steps. But the President himself raised this issue, raised the profile of this issue, the seriousness of the prospect that the Assad regime would use chemical weapons or transfer them to a terrorist group uh, last year. And it, the President has made clear from the beginning that this issue is uh, gravely serious. Now that we have a growing body of evidence that suggests uh, that we can say with varying degrees of confidence that he has in a limited way or that the regime has in a limited way likely used weapons. We need to build on that. It is absolutely the correct thing to do to uh, take the uh, exceptional work that our intelligence community does uh, and continue to build information. and. Uh, 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 put together a credible set of facts that can be corroborated, that's based on firm evidence, that can be reviewed, uh, and that is what we are in endeavoring to do. Uh, we are, of course, very much supportive of a United Nations investigation into this. Uh, the, pre the President led, the United States led in calling for that investigation, and we continue to press for that investigation to proceed unhindered. We are also working independently and with our uh, allies, uh, and with, most importantly, the Syrian opposition to assess credible reports of the use of chemical weapons and to uh, build evidence uh, to support the assessments that have been made thus far. And considering the seriousness of the implications, how much urgency do you feel to get to a definitive conclusion? If this uh, investigation that you were just speaking about, for instance, were to run on for a number of months, is that something that President Obama would be comfortable with? The President wants the facts, uh, and I'm not going to set a timeline because the facts need to be uh, what drives this investigation, not a deadline. The situation in Syria is and has been grave. The Assad regime has uh, the blood of its own people on its hands. There has been enormous loss of life and enormous disruption. And you have seen us, in a leadership role, uh, significantly increase our aid to the Syrian people through humanitarian assistance, significantly step up our assistance to the opposition, uh, including non-lethal assistance uh, directly to the Syrian military uh, council as part of the opposition. Uh, and that is in reaction to what we have seen in Syria. But, uh, you know, it is I think, instructive to look at the past for uh, guidance when it comes to the need to be very serious about uh, gathering all the facts, establishing chain of custody, uh, linking uh, evidence of the use of chemical weapons to specific incidents and actions taken by the regime. And that's, of course, what we will do, because that's the responsible thing to do. And on Tuesday from the podium, you said that the U.S. had, quote, not come to the conclusion that there had been one of these attacks. But we've since learned that the White House is, or the administration has known about this for a number of weeks. So how do you square those two statements? What I said, you're talking about conclusion versus uh, 
you know, varying degrees of confidence that weapons were used. I talked about conclusion in the context of crossing the red line, and what I'm saying today and what the White House said in the letters that were sent by uh, the director of our Office of Legislative Affairs to two senators on Capitol Hill uh, is that uh, we are continuing to work to build on the assessments made by the intelligence community, uh, that the confidence, uh, the degrees of confidence here are varying, that, that this is not an airtight case. And that is entirely the responsible thing to do, as I think uh, many observers of this, uh, with a little historical perspective, uh, have made clear uh, in the last 24 hours. Yes? Uh, Jay, yesterday's senior administration officials told reporters on a call that all options remained on the table, which I think you've said before. Mm -hmm. um, what does that mean now in the context of, of these letters? And how far away would the United States be from making a decision regarding military force? Well, the, the second part of your question goes to timelines, and, and uh, I'm not going to set any because uh, we need to be about the business of assembling a credible set of facts, assembling the evidence, assembling uh, corroborative information, uh, and that is what we're doing. And we are pressing uh, for a United Nations investigation into this as well. Uh, on the first part, all options remain on the table. The President has been clear about this. I have, as you, you noted, and uh, that remains the case. I'm not going to speculate about what action we might take uh, should we firmly establish that the red line has been crossed, but you, it is absolutely the case that all options remain on the table. And so what are the next steps then as you work on, on getting more information? Will there be more outreach to Russia uh, and China about this in terms of diplomacy and getting them uh, on board, what, what does the United States do next as you're looking for this evidence? Well, we work with our allies who have uh, been working on this issue. We work with the Syrian opposition uh, who have uh, obviously been helpful and can be helpful in providing evidence of chemical weapons use. We work with the United Nations and press uh, for a thorough United Nations investigation. We also continue to provide significant assistance to the opposition and to the, uh, Syri uh, the Syrian people who have been uh, displaced and in, are in need of humanitarian aid because of the violence in Syria. Uh, so it's a multifaceted approach uh, that is obviously focused in one sense on this issue of chemical weapons use, but is also more broadly about uh, our policy of helping the Syrian people rid themselves of the Assad regime and put themselves in a position for a better future. Okay, and one other topic. Uh, what does the White House think of the FAA legislation and, and when uh, and will the President sign it? Well, obviously it has to arrive here before he can sign it, so I don't have a timetable for that. Uh, look, we, the President would sign this if it's passed. And it will be good news for America's traveling public if Congress uh, spares them the unnecessary delays that we've seen that have resulted directly, as the Secretary of Transportation warned two months ago from this podium, would take place if the sequester were implemented. The furloughs were unavoidable. And you had a lot of uh, Republicans in particular who insisted that flexibility existed, uh, that this administration and the FAA itself could implement. Uh, and we made clear that that's not what the law said. And as I said the other day, you had members of Congress who uh, collectively wrote the law, voted for the law, but had not read the law. And what the action taken by, Cong taken by Congress now, an act of Congress uh, that is underway now to fix this specific and narrow problem with the FAA proves is that it requires Congress to act to deal with this. The problem is that this is just a Band-Aid solution. The uh, funding associated with the furloughs at the FAA is, I think, $253 million. That's one half of 1 percent, one half of 1 percent of the sequester. And it would be a welcome development if members of Congress, if Republicans who celebrated the sequester as a political victory, a home run, a Tea Party victory, would show uh, 
even a portion of the concern they showed about these real problems with flight delays for the families whose children have been kicked off of Head Start, for the seniors who have lost uh, access to the Meals on Wheels program, for communities hard hit by the cuts, the across the board mindless cuts in our defense budget, communities that depend on defense industries and on uh, military spending. We haven't seen that. It would be welcome if we did because these, the point of the sequester was that it was mindless. It was written in a way never to become law, written by and agreed to by both parties so that it would never become law because it would have these effects. It was designed to be terrible and onerous and, and lo and behold, whether it was a tactical political victory for the Tea Party or not to embrace it, these effects are happening. Step back and look at the big picture and you still see the CBO estimate of 750,000 jobs that would be lost uh, if the sequester were to run its full course, the uh, fully half a percentage point of GDP that would be cut from our growth. Uh, Congress has the power, as it did in this narrow case, Congress has the power to do the responsible thing, work with the President towards a balanced deficit reduction plan that invests in our economy, helps it grow, eliminates the sequester entirely, replaces it with sensible uh, deficit reduction, which was always the plan, and then we can move forward together as a nation. That remains within Congress's uh, power to do, and that's why the President has been engaged with lawmakers of both parties uh, in conversation about how we can find common ground and move forward on these specific budget issues. Okay. Yeah. How is it fair or right or just that these kids on Head Start get their cuts, uh, that these cuts go into effect at the Defense Department, and it's tough luck? But when a bunch of business travelers start belly aching because their flights are delayed because of these uh, furloughs at the FAA, that they get one of the fastest pieces of legislation to move through Washington in recent memory. How is, why doesn't the President take a stand against that? You could have thrown in members of Congress who need flights home uh, also. But the fact is the delays, why not, why, why the delays, the are, the, the delays are, are a problem for not just business travelers and members of Congress, but, uh, but for many Americans. And, and that's a real negative consequence of the sequester. But your point is excellent. And we call on Congress to show as much concern for uh, others who are being harmed by other Americans, hardworking, middle class families who are being hurt by this, hardworking communities uh, that depend on defense industries and should not have been dealt this blow uh, of arbitrary cuts that cause furloughs and layoffs uh, and job terminations because uh, Congress decided, the Republicans decided, and they said it publicly. You know what? Everything we said about how terrible this sequester is going to be, never mind. Uh, it's a victory. It's a Tea Party why, so why is the president making an exception then for the air travelers? The, the, the president believes it's good news to eliminate this problem. But as I've said and, uh, you know, he believes this is a, a Band-Aid uh, covering a massive wound to the economy. This is $253 million out of an $80-plus billion over seven-month problem. And Congress should do the responsible thing and stop you know, dealing with these issues from crisis to crisis and simply engage in a discussion about how we can eliminate the sequester entirely through balanced deficit reduction. In the end, you know, this is a choice between special interest tax breaks, you know, closing loopholes in the tax code that the well-off and well-connected enjoy but average Americans can't and don't. Uh, on the one hand versus these harmful and unnecessary cuts on the other. And if they would move forward with the kind of balanced deficit reduction that was under discussion late last year uh, that includes revenue earned f through tax reform uh, along the lines that Speaker Boehner openly talked about late last year and couple that with uh, tough choices and entitlement reforms that also produce savings. And, and we can get somewhere productive here for the economy and for the American middle class. And just to follow up on Syria, yesterday uh, White House officials said uh, on, that, on that conference call with reporters that, uh, that 
there is a need to be careful because look what happened with Iraq and, and the weapons of mass destruction uh, that didn't exist in Iraq. But in Syria, you do have some evidence that chemical weapons were used on the people there. Isn't there a concern that you might be showing leniency when it comes to the use of weapons of mass destruction? Absolutely not. And uh, the fact is that we do have uh, some evidence and we need to build on that. We do have uh, varying degrees of confidence that uh, in the assessments that are being made that uh, chemical weapons were used in a limited way, but we need to build on that. And the, the precedent you cite, I think, is a significant one. Uh, and it simply stands to reason that you know, our, the assessments that we make, the, the intelligence community makes, are extraordinarily valuable and they do excellent work, uh, but they are building blocks towards uh, a broader objective here, which is the accumulation of concrete evidence, uh, evidence that can be corroborated, ev evidence that can be presented and reviewed, uh, and, uh, and then acted on uh, if, it, if the conclusion is that a red line has been crossed. Let me, uh, I want to move around a little bit because I, I, I noticed that for several times in the last few weeks we spent about 45, I mean, uh, 45 minutes on the, the front row here. Yeah. Syria, just follow up. First of all, uh, what exactly varying uh, degree of confidence means? And the second is uh, there are several uh, claims on the ground that the, the chemical weapons used. Uh, has the US, uh, US government in any way been able to investigate it? any of these uh, claims on the ground with the rebels. And the last question is, just yesterday again, uh, there were some senators uh, started calling uh, uh, no-fly zone uh, in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, have these new developments uh, changed any of your views to, to take additional steps? Well, I'd say a few things. We, we are, uh, of course, working with the Syrian opposition uh, on this effort. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to get into specific reports and, and our assessments of the specific reports uh, of instances of use, uh, the use of chemical weapons, but uh, simply to say that work, the Syrian opposition is a key component in uh, an effort to gather more information and uh, establish facts and uh, answer questions about chain of custody and things like that. Uh, secondly, the, the, I think the comments that you ref referred to coming from Capitol Hill go to the question of responses. And, uh, you know, we're in the process here of gathering evidence and uh, to establish whether or not a red line has in fact been crossed, uh, established in a way that is corroborated and verifiable and reviewable. Uh, and uh, that's a very important task. We are not in a static position here. We, as I mentioned earlier, ha are, have been uh, significantly increasing and broadening the scope of our ins assistance to the opposition, uh, as well as, as you know, committing significant resources to the humanitarian effort for the Syrian people. Uh, and we are working both uh, with uh, the United Nations, but, but with uh, friends and allies and partners who are concerned about the Syrian problem to help bring about a change there that allows the Syrian people a chance at a better future, that, 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 that a future that obviously has to exclude uh, a tyrant who has been killing his own people now for two years. All right. In the wake of um, the Texas and Boston explosions, some Democrats have been making an argument about the role of government, and the President hasn't. And I wonder if he believes that more regulations could prevent what happened in Texas, that more funding for first responders would make it easier to deal with things like what happened in Boston. And if he does, why hasn't he made that argument? Well, I, I think that we have to step back for a moment and, and note that regarding the, the tragic explosions in West Texas, that's a matter under investigation. We do not know uh, concretely what the cause was. That is under investigation. The, the response by first responders in Boston, I think, has been noted to have been remarkable and justifiably so. Uh, so I, I, I'm, you know, I'm sure that 
a, a lot of evaluations, as is wholly appropriate, will be made as uh, time passes about lessons we can learn in, in each instance, obviously very distinct events, but in each instance, and that, that's the way uh, it should work. But I don't think we're at the stage yet uh, that your question suggests in terms of uh, making those judgments. The President's focused on, uh, as he was yesterday, grieving with the families of victims and, uh, of, the, of the, uh, the fertilizer plant explosion. Uh, that was a, a, an incredibly powerful service that he attended, and uh, if you didn't join us and, or didn't watch it, it really is uh, worth doing because it was, it was incredibly powerful, and uh, not least because of the remarkable bravery and commitment to community <coughs> that these uh, almost entirely volunteer first responders demonstrated by running towards a situation that all of them had to know was uh, one that would put them at great risk uh, on behalf of their fellow citizens. And uh, so, so, and that's, and that was, an, uh, and, and he met with families and he met with local and state officials uh, to talk about that. Uh, and we're obviously in the, in still the early phases of investigating uh, everything around the Boston incident. Uh, so uh, the questions are certainly valid, but uh, I don't have specific responses for you now. Do you think it's somehow inappropriate or distasteful to use these tragedies to make an argument about the role of government? I mean, I haven't had that discussion with them. I just think that the um, focus now is uh, on the areas that I just discussed. John. Uh, Jay, did the President mean it when he said use of chemical weapons would be a game changer in Syria? Yes, he did. So what does that mean? And what's a red line? What, what are we talking about here? The President made clear that the use of or the transfer to terrorist groups of chemical weapons by the Assad regime would be uh, crossing a red line. And he retains all options to respond including to that. Including military force, including military he, strikes. All options. All options. And, uh, and there are many tools that a president has available to him in this kind of situation. Uh, so they include all options, including the ones you mentioned, but there are many other options. And that's not to suggest one direction or the other, simply to say that, that uh, often the discussion when, when people mention all options are on the table, uh, you know, everyone just talks about military force. And uh, it's important to remember that uh, there, are, there are options available to a commander in chief uh, in a situation like this, that are uh, that include but go be, uh, include but uh, are not ex uh, exclusive to that option. Secondly, uh, I'm not going to speculate about the actions the United States may take should it be firmly established that a red line was crossed. But I will confirm that he was very serious about that. He obviously went out of his way to make that point uh, from this very podium because of the seriousness of it, and I think it demonstrates the fact that. The United States is focused in particular on this issue, and uh, appropriately so. Given that he got here in the first place as somebody who questioned intelligence and called for resisting the clamor to go to war over intelligence about weapons of mass destruction in this same region, does it make <coughs> him a little more skeptical about the intelligence he's receiving now, a little less likely to take it at face value? He, he has enormous faith in our intelligence community. Uh, but he also believes that uh, the proper use of intelligence in a case like this is uh, to have it be a component of, but not the only source of, uh, your decision-making process. It's not, that, as I was saying before, this is a, an important building block towards uh, gathering the evidence that needs to be gathered in a situation like this. Um, and the precedent you mentioned is, an, is a significant one. Uh, but it's simply setting aside that one uh, precedent. It's important just to acknowledge that in, the assessments are not, uh, they're based in part on facts, but they're not solely facts. They're the judgments of uh, professionals. They are not uh, in and of themselves policy decisions. And that is what uh, presidents, uh, you know, a president makes a the kinds of decisions that 
uh, are made in this situation, and he or she makes them based on, should make them based on a broad array of information. Major. Major. Continue that conversation. Uh, I know you believe, and you said the President believes that the red line is a reasonable standard and that factual evidence must be behind it to support it. I'd like you to address some concerns that the Syrian opposition has expressed and some in Congress have expressed it. The volatility and the chaos of the Civil War itself may make it practically impossible to obtain that kind of definitive proof, making the red line more rhetorical than practical. The fact is we have some evidence. That is what uh, is reflected in the letter that was sent to two senators, reflected in the conversations that uh, some of you had with government officials yesterday. And we have been able to gather some evidence to that undergird the, the assessments that are being made. Uh, but we are not uh, done with the process by any means. We are building on that. And we are able to uh, not just press for a United Nations investigation, which is essential, but uh, to work with our friends and allies and the Syrian opposition to procure, share, and evaluate additional information associated with reports of the use of chemical weapons so that we can establish the facts. So the answer to your question is uh, the concerns that you've mentioned are real, but the, it is also the case that we are able to work uh, with our friends and allies and the Syrian opposition to gather more facts to help establish a set of facts and evidence that uh, can be corroborated, and that's what we're setting about to do. Will the President commit to, if in fact the red line is crossed, whatever happens will be done multilaterally, not unilaterally? I will not speculate about uh, what action he uh, might decide to take in the event that that assessment is made. That's, that's too many steps forward. I will simply say that he, he won't commit will. He will. doing it in concert with allies. He may, the United States may act unilaterally. Well, the, obviously, the, as a general principle, the United States retains uh, the ability to act unilaterally as a general pr principle. But on this case, I'm not going to make uh, a speculative judgment about what decision he might make should that uh, assessment and that decision or conclusion be reached. Is the FAA legislation, now that the administration has endorsed it and looked at this process and seen it take some unexpected turns, a model for resolving other issues related to sequestration? I, no, because uh, of the well, point. I, I'm not going to attach a number, you know, how many times you can do it, but the fact is it's a drop in the bucket. It's a Band-Aid over, uh, I think it was kind of a gross metaphor, but a big wound. The, 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 the fact is this is a small uh, amount of funding compared to the overall sequester. It's $253 million. There was an ability uh, because of unobligated funds available uh, that could be transferred only through an act of Congress, not through administrative action that was because it was not legal uh, otherwise. Uh, and this is a, a one-off case, if you will. And, it, and, and the question points to the over, overall problem here, which is that the sequester itself uh, cannot be finessed. It is having negative consequences around the country. Do you understand the, the practical governmental curiosity that people who are feeling the effects of sequestration might have? If someone were to present to the administration something they could deal with access to cancer funding, as an example, as an illustrative example only, that found money or that was a one-time Band-Aid thing, would the administration be open to that? I'm saying there will be creative people in Congress who will try to find ways to deal with individual things, and what I'm trying to figure out, that's a worthwhile endeavor for them. A worthwhile endeavor would be a decision to eliminate the sequester entirely. The, the, the effort expended uh, should be expended on that, because that uh, would deal with the whole problem and the broader impact of the sequester on our economy and on job creation. You know, given how the Congress deliberates and uh, the disagreements that exist on uh, you know, a variety of narrow specific issues, you can imagine uh, how little would be accomplished if that were the path that were chosen. The right path is simply to come to the agreement on principle uh, that everybody used to agree on, which is that the sequester should never be implemented and we need to eliminate it and we need to eliminate it through balanced deficit reduction. That was the way it was designed. That was the charge given to the super committee. Avoid this terrible thing by coming up with a bipartisan agreement on deficit reduction. Right, related to Jim's question, if someone were to come to the administration with a solution for food stamps, for example, or 
Meals on Wheels, the administration would say forget about it? No, we're not. I, look, I, I'm not going to speculate about that because it's, it's not remotely practical. I would certainly welcome uh, and uh, be pleasantly surprised by concern on the part of Republicans for uh, kids who have been thrown off of their Head Start programs or seniors who aren't receiving their Meals on Wheels. That would be a positive step. But the fact is, the way to deal with this problem is to rid ourselves of it entirely through responsible governing. And uh, that, has what, that is what's been absent uh, on Capitol Hill of late. Yes? And given Congress's willingness to pass this FAA bill, is there concern in the White House that this is the approach Congress is going to take going forward with slicing off these individual pieces? I, I think I've tried to address this. The, it is not credible to imagine that you can mitigate the damage done to our economy uh, in a piecemeal Band-Aid fashion. We are pleased that we can take this action uh, to alleviate the problems caused in our, uh, for uh, uh, Americans traveling uh, and, and at, our, at our airports. But this is a, a Band-Aid solution. It does not solve the bigger problem. And it is impractical to expect that uh, all of the negative consequences of sequester can be solved this way. The right way to do it, the responsible way to do it, the way that I think Americans across the country, uh, when they have time to even consider this issue in their busy lives, would want Congress uh, to take is, is to simply eliminate the sequester, to go about deficit reduction in a responsible way, to concede that when you called it, you being, you know, random Republican member of the House, a Tea Party victory, uh, you weren't really thinking about how it hurt average Americans. You were thinking about politics inside the Beltway. You were thinking about whether or not you're going to have a primary or uh, how this would affect your stature in the leadership. And that's not what the American people sent you here to do. Uh, they sent you here to solve problems in a common sense way. And instead, by allowing the sequester to be implemented, Congress has caused problems for average Americans uh, at airports, in, in, you know, in the homes of middle class folks who are struggling to get by, in military communities around the country. Congress has caused problems, made things worse unnecessarily by adopting a policy they themselves decried only a few months ago. Bill, sorry, go ahead. How soon after the President signs the bill will the controllers and the FAA be back up at controllers be back at work? I would have to ask you to check with the FAA. I'm not sure how that process will work. Bill. Uh, at the risk of piling on, I think the problem the folks are having is that aren't you contradicting yourselves and aren't with the, and sending the wrong message by saying the sequester is bad, you've got to address it across the board, but we'll sign this one bill carving out this one exception. And aren't you just inviting more exceptions? Bill, I appreciate the question, but there is no way for this practically be de to be done except in a broad action by Congress to eliminate the sequester. Why are you signing this bill? That's my question. Because this is causing unnecessary harm to travelers around the country, and uh, this is a, a specific case where an act of Congress could take unobligated funds from one account and apply them uh, a relatively small amount compared to the size of the sequester uh, to address these furloughs. Uh, but it is exactly what I've been saying, a Band-Aid solution that does not solve, solve the bigger wait, problem. But don't you accept that somebody's going to come down the road tomorrow with another, it could be small business, it could be farmers, it could be, as Major said, cancer patients. Somebody else is going to come up with another, the same argument. Bill, they may. What I'm saying is that uh, this is not the answer. We are, ha we, as, uh, we're very concerned about the effects that these furloughs would have on uh, air travelers. So much so that the Secretary of Transportation came here two months ago and warned the American people about it. I, I, it was uh, very amusing to me to hear con members of Congress say, you know, the administration blindsided us. They didn't say this was happening. And then, uh, fortunately, some uh, very worthy, worthy producers at uh, television stations found the video of a cabinet secretary telling the American people and Congress and you that this would happen. Uh, and uh, it behooves the members of Congress to read the laws they pass, preferably before they pass them, but sometimes after. Wendell. Some analysts think that the limited use of, of chemical weapons in Syria, which we understand were 
uh, two occasions last month, suggests that perhaps it was ordered by one of Assad's generals, not Assad himself. And that suggests that all of the chemical weapon stocks may not be in Assad's control. Is that, too, a red line? I'll say two things about that. One is we still uh, believe, based on the information that we have, that the stockpiles of chemical weapons uh, in Syria are under the control of the Syrian regime. Two, because of that, Assad is responsible for the disposition of those chemical weapons. And uh, it is his responsibility first and foremost not to use them or to transfer them to terrorist groups, uh, but to secure them and make sure that they are not uh, used by anybody else. So, uh, I mean, that's all I can really say about it. Uh, that's our assessment at this time. Senator McCain says that this push for proof uh, may be an excuse not to act at all. How do you respond to that? I think that it is uh, the responsible thing to do. It is what the American people want and expect their leaders in Washington to do uh, on a matter uh, of such seriousness, to ensure that we have gathered all the facts, that we build on the quality work done by our intelligence community, and work with our allies and the Syrian opposition, as well as the United Nations, to assemble a credible set of facts that can be corroborated and can be reviewed uh, before we make decisions about whether a red line has in fact been crossed and uh, before we make decisions about what action to take uh, if that's the case. Yeah. Jay, there are bipartisan calls for action. Um, Senator Dianne Feinstein has said the red line has clearly been crossed. They seem to think that this intelligence uh, is more reliable than the White House at this point. Why is there a discrepancy? Why can Senator Dianne Feinstein say with such clarity that she believes the red line has been crossed and, and yet the White well, House? Well, you can you can you can ask individual lawmakers uh, for their assessments and and what they're based on. What I can tell you is that our intelligence community, which is providing the same information to members of Congress, uh, assesses with varying degrees of confidence that the Syrian regime has used chemical weapons on a small scale in Syria, specifically the chemical agent. Sarin. And this assessment is based in part on physiological samples, as we talked about yesterday. Now, we are working to establish credible and corroborated facts to build on this intelligence assessment. That is the right and responsible thing to do. Uh, that is what uh, we should do, and I think the American people would expect us to do in a circumstance like this. To go back to Major's point, Syria hasn't even let UN inspectors in, so how do you expect to get this answer? Again, we call on the Assad regime to cooperate with the United Nations investigation that they said they wanted, but we are not relying on the United Nations alone. We are working with our allies and our partners, and we are working with the Syrian opposition to uh, gather information and facts to assess credible reports of the use of chemical weapons. And we will continue to do that. That is, again, uh, the right path forward. Where does Russia factor into this? I know you were, you were asked about this, but is that a part of the strategy moving forward to try to get Russia engaged at this point so the United States doesn't have to get engaged? Well, we have made clear in the past about our disagreements with Russia on the matter uh, here uh, the fa and, and, and on Syria in general. There have been Security Council votes that re reflect our profound disagreements with the Russians on this, but we continue to discuss with the Russians and others, uh, the nature of the Assad regime, the brutal assault that Assad has waged against his own people, the, uh, the massive harm done uh, to the Syrian people. Well, the and and the issue, no, I'm not, I, again, I, I, we will continue to work with the United Nations and members of the Security Council, but we will also uh, proceed, as I just described, with uh, allies and partners and the Syrian opposition in our uh, investigation here into these, uh, you know, the, the reports of, the credible reports of chemical weapons use. And just one on immigration, Jay. Representative Goodlatte has said he plans to introduce uh, immigration reform in pieces. Would the President support that approach? I'm not going to speculate about bills that haven't been written or submitted. I will say that the President has made clear for quite some time that 
we need to reform our immigration system in a comprehensive way. Uh, and that includes enhanced border enforcement. It includes uh, improving our legal immigration system. It includes uh, uh, holding businesses accountable. And it includes a clear path to citizenship. Uh, and that's, those are sort of the four corners of what a comprehensive immigration reform bill would look like. It is also reflected in the legislation proposed by the Gang of Eight in the Senate. Uh, you know, these principles are very important. And I think that it, it we, have, we have seen this effort for a while now here in Washington. Uh, and we have seen it uh, move forward but not succeed yet. But I think what has become abundantly clear to everyone here who's followed it or worked on it, uh, it will only get done if it is done in a broad, comprehensive, and bipartisan way. The President spoke about this yesterday at the ceremony uh, at the George W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum. Uh, he credited appropriately President George W. Bush for his support for comprehensive immigration reform. Um, and uh, I think that reflects the fact that a consensus or a, a bipartisan consensus was building uh, and at this time is growing even more uh, in Washington and across the country behind the need to do this. And the President will continue to work with the Congress to try to get this done. Yes. Zach. And then right. um, while it's true that many Americans are affected by the flight delays, it seems that people of means, businessmen, members of Congress will be most affected traveling all the time. So what I don't understand is why the president didn't say, okay, you know, Republicans are agreeing to this, but you're going to have to do something for the very poor being affected by the sequester. You know, if you're going to fix this for people who fly, we're going to demand that something be done for Head Start, uh, for senior, uh, poor seniors, for something for the most vulnerable who are affected too. Look, the president does insist that Congress take action uh, to eliminate the harm being done by the sequester wow. and the harm. Uh, so you're suggesting we should hold hostage American travelers to uh, Congress's refusal to act. Or I want to know why you're not using that the, leverage. The, the fact is, Zach, we support an effort here underway in Congress to take care of this problem. And we are highlighting, as I am today, the fact that it is a Band-Aid solution that deals with one half of one percent, not even, of the sequester. And that the responsible and right thing to do by Congress is to address the entire sequester and the harm that it's doing to families across the country and communities that depend on defense industries uh, by eliminating it, by, you know, you know, reversing themselves and their folly when they declared it a, they, the Republicans in this case, declared it a victory, a great thing for them politically and the Tea Party. Uh, I don't think Americans who have suffered under this, either because they've been laid off or furloughed. Uh, I don't uh, feel that way, and, I, and I'm sure that families who uh, have been dealing with the fact that their child is no longer in Head Start feel that way. I'm sure that Americans who have been delayed in airports for hours feel that way, uh, unless they're just devoted Tea Party members. So even as they're sitting on the tarmac for three hours, they can say, well, that feels like victory. Uh, I doubt it. So. Uh, the Congress needs to do something about it. They need why, to take action. Why not wait a week or two more and see, and say to Congress, we're not going to sign this bill unless you do something that really protects the most vulnerable in society, and then we can deal with people who We're calling on Congress to do that. We're not going to, uh, we, we, we will sign, I think you're, you're imagining leverage here, Zach, the, the, uh, that is about political gamesmanship. We're about trying to get stuff, getting things done here on behalf of the American people. Donovan. Jay, two quick questions on Syria following on. Um, uh, you said earlier that, that the administration really is trying now to build a case. Uh, that well, let me clarify. We're trying to find out if there is, in fact, a credible, verifiable case. Right. And so who would that case be presented to? Well, you, again, you, you're, getting, you're, you're taking me beyond where we are, speculating about what the next steps would be. Most importantly, we have to take the evidence that we have uh, and the varying degrees of, of confidence that we have about the assessment that chemical weapons have been used and build on that. And that's what we're going to do. And that's what we're going to do, not just alone, but working with our allies and partners and the Syrian opposition. Uh, and, and as we, in concert with that action, work to press the United Nations investigation forward. 
Uh, what happens after that obviously depends on uh, what conclusions are made and what facts are gathered. Okay, and then you said also that if the, the administration believes that Assad has custody and full responsibility for the weapons, so any verified use of the weapons, no matter how used them, who used them, uh, would be, he would be the uh, responsible party, is that correct? Without getting into a specific instance that, you know, is, is speculation at this point, uh, it is a fact that he is responsible uh, for the stocks of chemical weapons that are under control of his regime. But again, I don't want to speculate about the judgments we would make based on uh, verified, you know, a, a use of chemical weapons that we've been able to verify and have a set of credible facts to back up because we're still in the process of um, gathering those facts. Tests. We right. have said that we have physiological samples, uh, but uh, we do not have uh, all the information we need to uh, be more than, uh, to have more than just varying degrees of confidence that this has happened. Uh, and we need to be able to have uh, a credible set of facts that are corroborated and that uh, are reviewable. And, uh, you know, that is obviously what we're trying to, to establish now. Thanks, Jake. Do Victoria, one more in the back. There are about 100 detainees in Guantanamo on hunger strike now. It's a bit of a mess. Um, Senator Dianne Feinstein is saying that the low-level Yemenis should be repatriated. Do you agree with that? Well, I can tell you that we continue to monitor the hunger strikers at Guantanamo closely. And this is something, obviously, that the Defense Department has the most specific information on. Here at the White House, the President remains committed to closing the detention facility at Guantanamo Bay. Some progress has been made under this administration and under the previous administration. However, Congress has enacted and renewed legislation in order to foreclose our ability to close the detention facility, legislation which restric restricts our experienced counterterrorism professionals from exercising their best judgment as to what the most appropriate disposition is for the individuals held there. We, uh, as you know, may have been, there was a process and continues to be a process that assesses uh, the detainees at Guantanamo, uh, and that process is ongoing. But the fun, a, a fundamental obstacle here to closing this detention facility, uh, which is so clearly, uh, the President believes, and, and his predecessor and uh, numerous others, including military leaders, believe is in our national security interest to do, uh, the obstacle remains uh, at Congress. But we're going to continue to press forward in trying to, uh, to deal with this problem. Well, the President Feinstein is saying that with the change in leadership in Yemen, it would be okay now to send those Yemenis back to that country because there is a much stronger leadership against al-Qaeda. How do you feel about that? Well, I, I think those are assessments that are made by uh, professionals who uh, look at both the situation in Yemen and, and at the detainees, but I don't have any new information or announcements to make uh, regarding those detainees. Okay. I do have a week ahead. Thanks. The schedule for the week of April 29th, 2013, is as follows. On Monday, the President will deliver remarks at the National Academy of Sciences' 150th anniversary. On Tuesday, as part of the Joining Forces Initiative, President Obama, Vice President Biden, First Lady Michelle Obama, and Dr. Jill Biden will make a significant employment announcement for veterans and military spouses. This event will take place here at the White House. On Wednesday, the President will attend meetings at the White House. On Thursday morning, the President will depart Washington, D.C. for his visit to Mexico and Costa Rica. This trip is an important opportunity to reinforce the deep cultural, familial, and economic ties that so many Americans share with Mexico and Central America. While in Mexico, the President looks forward to meeting with President Peña Nieto. The President welcomes the opportunity to discuss ways to deepen our economic and commercial partnership and further our engagement on the broad array of bilateral, regional, and global issues that connect our two countries. On Friday afternoon, the President will depart Mexico for Costa Rica. While in Costa Rica, the President looks forward to the opportunity to meet with President Chinchilla, as well as heads of state of the other Central American countries and the Dominican Republic. Uh, whom the President has graciously offered to host. 
The trip will be an important chance to discuss our collective efforts to promote economic growth and development in Central America and our ongoing collaboration on citizen security. On Saturday afternoon, the President will depart Costa Rica and return to Washington, D.C. On Sunday, the President will deliver the commencement address at The Ohio State University. He will return to Washington, D.C. later that day. Thanks all. Okay.